This is Bob Baker with John Harrington. Bob Baker of Jazz Guitar Today with John Harrington. And we're just kind of getting together. John was our uh, Jazz Guitar Today's very first cover, cover story. Yeah, yeah well, Pat, well, the Steve Martino, thing is a very uh, unusual hybrid, and it's very uh, unique. In some ways, some of the early records sound a little of the time, but the style of music you know everybody knows what bebop is everybody knows what you know hard bop is or most people know what that is and and what people would call fusion mm -hmm. and all of that but what do you call the style of guitar that you play with steely dan what what, what do you i mean is it jazz is it rock is it well it's a that's a it's a tough question and yeah uh, i know and thankfully the labels uh, don't make much difference to the to the players and the, and probably to a lot of listeners it's probably a good thing uh, but it's an interesting question nonetheless um for me um i i don't really even think of myself as a jazz guitar player even though i spent a good good period of my life uh devoted to studying jazz mm -hmm. um i was quite young but you know i i gave I sold my gold top Les Paul and my PA system and and instead bought a, a like an arch top Johnny Smith uh, FL guitar, you know, to play right. jazz on and <laughs> didn't right. play a string for about 10 years or something like that, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, and I, I, I think I know that music very well, um, but I, do, I don't really gig doing jazz i don't do jazz gigs right. per se um and haven't in well let me many, let me many just years, let me so. let me let me put a, put a let me let me just say this parenthetically the name of the magazine is jazz guitar today but but really it's was more improvisational modern guitar is what we're trying to to address yes well well that's an interesting thing i i recently saw a bill evans the piano player bill evans uh mm -hmm. video and he uh was talking about his understanding of the term jazz um and he likened it more to he, he thinks of it not as a st as a label of style mm -hmm. but as a label of process and he even connected what he did as an improviser to what most composers did a hundred years before him because all of all of the like ba i mean it would have been I would love to have been in the room when Bach were, was improvising, you know? <laughs> or when or when Mozart sat down just you know after a glass of wine and just I'll started sit, inventing. You know? I'll sit I mean, next I to would you. love to have seen yeah. that. And you know, these guys were incredible oh, improvisers. They mm -hmm. have to have been. Yeah. And Bill Evans was talking about jazz as as this process of you know uh that kind of music creation like in the moment music creation and i i like that better than i like even though i mean of course it, it has been used you know uh, as a description of a type of music of genres of music and then there are sub sub genres and as you as you said there's hard pop there's you know there's right. fusion there's whatever it goes on and on you know and, and yeah, I mean, th those are all useful for certain things. It, maybe they're useful for radio programmers, for people selling music, whatever, For if you're looking for a certain kind of music that that you uh, want to explore. Uh, all very useful. But but thankfully, also, also usually pretty irrelevant to the people making the music, I, I think, most of the time. But with the, the Steely Dan gig, it seems to me that even though... Uh, I never play with anything that is even close to being called a jazz guitar sound in terms of the tone of most of what we think of as traditional jazz guitar sounds. On the other hand, a player in that chair, in that band, trying to play that music with, with no knowledge of jazz harmony would be lost at sea. So um, the reason I don't use a jazz guitar sound on Steely Dan is because the records sort of set the tone for me and right. set the precedent for the kind of sound that works with this music. Right. And above all, I'm sort of a team player. I want the whole thing to work. I, I, I don't play in Steely Dan any differently uh, conceptually uh, in the biggest picture sense. Uh, I don't play in Steely Dan any differently than I did in Rob's band. I tried to find what the music is asking for first. Right. I mean, that that's always first. If there's room for some personal expression 
and I'm still taking care of business in the in the big picture team, you know, ensemble sense, then I love that and, and I go for it. But but my my basic primary priority is always do try to make the big picture of the music. You know, do right. what I can to make that as great as it can be. And but, and those records are just stunning. You know, those well, they're they're just such great I mean, everything about those records is so good that it, if you start there, you're going to be in good shape. You know, it's funny you say. I mean, those records are, if if anything's perfect, they're perfect. <laughs> yeah, they're just. You know, I mean, just, uh, they got fussier and fussier about them. I I like even the earlier ones, which have a little more of a live energy kind of. Royal Scam has a real sort of, kind of vital, in your face kind of, almost like you're there live. You know, mm -hmm. and and the the later records seem a little more, uh, you know, carefully and meticulously yeah. manicured, you know, but, uh, but they're so beautiful, you know, and, uh, well, yeah, there, if there's, if, if anything's perfect, you know, yeah, the music point of view, the recordings are, I mean, every, I mean, every, everything about it, the writing was amazing, it, lyrically and musically, the producing was am amazing, yeah. the playing is amazing, I mean, they call, they're such great producers, I mean, they, right. they knew how to call, not only they knew how to call the right players, but they knew how to pick the right takes from the right players as well. So I Which, mean, in every in every detail, I mean, and the recording quality was always they were always careful about that. They were concerned with that. They had like just standard, like very high musicianship value. They wanted like things in tune, in time, and they wanted character, and they and they wanted fun, you know. And and it's just you know, every every little part of it was executed so beautifully. That's why those records. I mean, to me the like the top three uh, have to be Asia, Gaucho, and the Nightfly, you know, because, and, and they are a sort of the, they're, they're, they're the sort of end of the first big sort of sequence of, of great uh, record making together, you know, that happened in a, in a time period that was with no interruption. It was 18 years before they did another uh, studio record which was the first one i got to play on uh two against nature and in, in, i came out in 2000 i played in 1999 on it but that was a that was sort of another phase and, and it sort of feels like another phase because it's right. so much newer and a little disconnected from the earlier work you know you're not the only one that feels those those records are amazing i mean oh, the, well, the no. world the world recognizes they certainly those records do, yeah. unfortunately all we can do right now is talk about it we, we can't play we yeah we, i know that the that's, second that's... for the second year in a row the uh, summer tour which oh, was geez, don't uh, tell me. a double bill with stevie winwood has been moved oh so god so this I... summer is not happening it's it's booked again i mean oh. postponed again for next summer but it, it'll probably happen next summer I Me absolutely too. love Steve Winwood. Still sounds unbelievable. But, he plays great. I mean, so you know, I have to tell you that this, this little amp I'm playing through the uh, the Kemper mm -hmm. the amp, the it's a profiling amplifier. They call it. Yeah, Kemper. Sure. You know it. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty popular. Steve Winwood gave that to me. That was really? A gift. Yeah, it was a gift. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it's a fun story. I'll make it quick. We were uh, we were so, on the road doing another one of those double bills, and uh, his guitar player. Uh, who's an avid tennis player. We uh -huh. were, I think we were in Florida, in the south somewhere. It's hot. And like he was out there, regardless of the 100-degree heat. Right, he's going to play. Playing tennis for two or three hours, you know. Right. So he got heat stroke. And oh, he yeah. Missed well, a sh he missed a happen. show. Ooh. Uh, he missed a show, and S Steve was afraid that he might miss the next day's show, too, because right, we yeah. had another, another show the next day. And so that night, uh, the night before the, you know, the night he... He had gotten sick. Um, I got a call in my hotel room with no no guitar there. Can would you be willing to like? We'll send you some board tapes. Can would you be willing to learn the the, the show so that in yeah. case he, he's still sick the next day, you could sit in, you know, help us get through it, you know? And I said, well, sure, I'll give it a whirl, you know. And so uh, I didn't have a guitar, but uh, they they kept sending me board tapes. And the saxophone player in the band, Paul Booth. He uh, he was up all night writing charts for me, so I had to chords. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was I was up all night trying to learn this stuff, you know, and just trying to do it in my head with no guitar. Oh man! Arc but I knew a lot of the tunes, and yeah. I'd been listening to the band, so you know, it was it was kind of a tall order. But I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to play it like Jose can, but 
I'll probably, I can get through it. I think it'll help to have the guitar yeah. there, you know. Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but I was thankfully he felt well enough the next day so he looked kind of pale and he was sitting down but but he made sound check and he made the gig so uh but anyway uh, as a token of steve's appreciation he uh he knew i had my eye on this camper because they were both playing through those uh, right yeah guitar through those on their on that tour and it was kind of new to me and um and they were getting great sounds out of it so i was really curious and intrigued and uh so he said uh he said thanks for being willing to to jump in and uh, and as a as a token of my appreciation i'd like to buy him a kemper so he did it was a couple of weeks later i had one <laughs> so no nah, that's, that's pretty cool i mean not it, a, it's it's and it's ideal for the i'll tell you it's been ideal for uh for my little home you know you're talking about not using the traditional jazz tone I've had Robin Ford, I've had Mike Stern, I've had John Schofield, I've had Wayne Krantz, a yeah. whole slew of people. Oz Noy has got a quote that I absolutely love about this. And he says, it's jazz, it just doesn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, you know, and, and talking with, with all of those guys and, and more, they, they got what I'm going to call the... Um, the rock influenced players, you know, the Scott yeah. Hendersons and, and people yeah. of that. I mean, that is absolutely jazz music. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not bebop. It's not, you know, it's not hard bop. It's, it's, it's modern, you know, and, and yeah. you don't call it, you can't call it fusion because that's got a whole, that's like, yeah, it has connotations that are yeah connotations are, uh, to it, and, and also the, it it feels sort of like a, a dated sort of uh, yeah title of of, of a yeah. certain genre of an nobody, era. Nobody, well. yeah, nobody that plays that music calls it, likes to call it call it. No, music. no, probably not. Just for that reason. Well, that's why I think, uh, uh, at the risk of uh, you know being redundant, um, Bill Evans's uh, description of jazz as as a process instead right. of a. a a genre or a style, you know, right. is is really right on the money because if you think of jazz as doing that, you know, then then the sound is is kind of irrelevant. The sound is is you know something that's a stylistic element of anybody, any one of these guys, you know. They each play with a different sound, and uh, and uh, they certainly borrow from sonically borrow from genres. But what they're doing, if they're improvising, is the same uh, process of jazz. So if we think I, of jazz as a process, it's a beautiful way to look at it, I think. You know, I interviewed Fareed Hawk yesterday. Do you know Fareed? Uh, I yes. interviewed Fareed. Yeah, yesterday. I haven't talked to him in quite yesterday. a number of years. What a, what, a, what, a, what a mind that guy has. He's, yeah. he's an incredible guy. He really yeah. is. And he was, he was saying um, that he's... He's, I don't know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, so just, you know, take this, but he's been disappointed with guitarists um, because he feels the guitar hasn't progressed jazz along like piano players, like what Herbie did and what I Chicks did. I think he's right. Actually. Yeah, me, me too. I totally agreed <laughs> with him. And, and that's why I'm bringing it up to you right now. Yeah. And and he says, you know, like what Herbie did and and what Chick did and and um, and all of that was move the harmony, you know, move everything along. Right. And guitar just kind of sat back there, you know, back in nineteen, you know, fifty, fifty, 50 and, you know, even you know, it just didn't move along. And so the guys, you know, he was talking about Pat Martino, you know, specifically. He said Pat, mm -hmm. he said Pat had definitely had all the hard bob language and all that but for some reason he he moved his harmonies along and and you know if you listen to his original stuff you know like joyous lake and you know from there yeah and so it's just interesting that that there's there is a um i don't want to say pent up demand but there's a, a a pent up feeling that you know guitar needs to catch up you know um with with the with the more modern uh, approach, if you will. I, I, that, you know, that, that's I, a horrible language I'm using, but you get no, what I'm I, trying to say. I think I get what you're trying to say, and and I have I have some thoughts about it, and I I do think that uh, there there might be reasons that the that so many of the giants of jazz, as we think of them, um, the innovators, mm -hmm. uh, were either pianists or saxophone players. I mean, uh, 
they really seem to be like uh, better represented than any of the other instruments at the top of the heap. If absolutely, you think about it. absolutely. And and so I think it might that might not be a coincidence, but it might have something to do with with the nature of the instruments that they're playing. Uh, piano, of course. Um, uh, I, I don't think anybody would argue that it that it isn't uh, set up in a way which uh, lends itself more to sort of clarity in terms of the exploration of like, harmony and everything you can do with multiple notes th than the guitar. I mean, compared to the guitar, which is visually more difficult to master, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's there are more limitations to how many notes you can play at a time. There are many more limitations about uh, particular like close voicings that you can't get. You know, you have mm -hmm. to you have to work around a lot of its limitations. Right. That the piano just doesn't have. Now, of course, guitar has things that are unique to it, and we you know, we guitarists like to celebrate those things. And, and <laughs> I think the great players have done that. So sure. there are giants of in the world of guitar. But there are seldom guitarists who are giants in the world of harmony the way piano players in jazz have been, for instance. You know, right. so that's that's I think that really has something to do with the instrument. And saxophone is is just it's an instrument that uh, like that that it seems capable of just an incredible facility. You know, it's um, it's it's it lends itself to the virtuoso thing. You know. And that's why there was bird, and that's why uh, there was train. You know, that would have been harder to do on a guitar. <laughs> you know, it's just it, it, uh, it and guitars have typically been followed. I think the other thing is that bands, especially jazz bands, and in the, it, guitar is an odd man out until until rock and roll in the like mid fifties. You know, uh, guitar was sort of an unusual instrument. It was. Uh, a difficult instrument that composers didn't choose to write for unless they were guitar players, typically, right. once in a while, but not all that much. It had it had a fringe presence in in uh, in classical music and a sort of a separate. It also uh, even in I mean, early American music, it was banjo and then guitar for you know rhythm, much only rhythm. And it wasn't until Charlie Christian kind of around that time when it became like a uh, you know because of the amplifier, really, it became like a soloist instrument in its right. own right. Do you know? And of course, I mean, then it's following because already you've had like you know for 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 decades and decades you've had jazz improvisers on horns right. and pianos, you know, and guitar. But you haven't had them on guitar. I mean, there there are players, but but very few. And it's you know it's a, it's more of an accompaniment thing and less of a solo thing. You know? So it's not su it's not a surprise that it wasn't at the forefront. I mean, how many jazz bands, especially after that? To have a guitarist in a jazz band was not a really common thing. Really. No. I mean, um, look at Miles's great, you know, couple of quintets, you know, guitar player in those bands, you know. Guitar was sort of extra, you know. And then and then he was the guy that really, you know, because I, I, we did a little series on the guitar players, Miles Davis guitar players. Right. That's how we happened to get Schofield and Stern and Ford and... Um, you know, and so forth and so on. And but he wanted Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> it's what he told. He's what he yeah. told the guys. He said, I you know, I, I want Jimi Hendrix, right. you know, to play in this band. That's what I want. <laughs> and uh, so he was. I mean, that guy was a whole different thing. The, the 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 saxophone flows with a tone that is just um, you. You can't get out of the guitar unless you're playing loud. Right. Well, that's you know. why I fell in love with an amplifier. I yeah. Think, uh, more than I did a guitar. You know, I mean, yeah. like when I first started playing in high school, um, I had been a saxophone player as a kid, not a good one, but I had played for years. And I think my ear was drawn to the sound of a sustaining overdriven yeah. amplifier. You know, that, that kind of guitar was what perked my ears up. Not, sure. not a, a clean jazz guitar. In fact, uh, the first day I heard Led Zeppelin, the first record Led Zeppelin made, Get that Kemper, wind that Kemper up. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like <laughs> that one. You know. I love it. <laughs> the first day I heard that was the same day I heard like, um, 
like West Montgomery, you know, like uh, you know, that's you know, like yeah, you know, like, you know, like something like that. Like, it was one of those records, you know. And and uh, my my next door neighbor, was a good buddy of mine, his older brother had been shopping and had come home with a West Montgomery record and led and the first Led Zeppelin record. Well. <laughs> It was clear to me which one I wanted to hear. You know, it was only Led Zeppelin for me oh, at the time. You know? Yeah, and, sure. But of course, you know, I mean, fast forward like 30 years, well, not even 30 years, but even 15 years, and I was a huge West Montgomery fan. I mean, and I right. always will be. He's at the top of the heap to me of uh, jazz guitar. So. I, I'm... I'm agreeing, agreeing with you. He's, he's my favorite of the of the of the genres, Wes. So, yeah, so. I think that I think you know what your your story is is really in line with the stories of people like John Schofield and Mike Stern and <laughs> yeah, I mean they all say I'm basically yeah. they all say basically the same thing and and I don't want to put words in people's mouths but it, you know they 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 grew up playing playing rock and roll and yeah, that's that's the sensibilities that they are infused with and what's really interesting is that. You know, it's like, um, you know, the, the the ages of those guys. I mean, they're not kids, you know, that are they're playing that, you know. No. And then you got Larry Carlton, of course, who plays with an overdriven, you know, he's, you know, playing, with, it has been playing with overdriven tone forever and oh, ever yeah. and ever and ever. Yeah. I mean, these guys aren't, you know, they're not kids. Yet no, no. I mean, well, you know, that we were, we were, I was born in the 50s and, uh, and the sounds of my youth, you know, were, I mean, I was hooked from the Beatles even earlier, but, but especially if it's, it's, it's the turning point for a lot of guitar players. It's, oh, abso- absolutely. it's 1964 the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. You know, it's like after that, there's no, there's no going back. There's no going back. <laughs> Let's uh, man, this is great. It really is great. But I, I, um, I, I, I didn't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to talk about what you're doing now. You, you're t- talking about a lot of solo guitar work and yeah, well, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, a newly apt thing to do, you know, in the last year, <laughs> with all this you're time home, you're at home on my hands, you know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, when the pandemic, uh, when lockdown first started uh, over a year ago, I, mm-hmm. uh, I sort of, I did, I, after the shock of the first couple of weeks, I guess, began to settle and I wear off a little. I, uh, I tried to sort of prioritize like okay well what what's important for me to do here with this time i can't i'm not gonna be able to work that was that was pretty clear um so what do i want to do with all this time you know, <laughs> is there anything i want to do and like uh what what might the most important things be so um i i had a few things on the list um but one of them was to keep uh, a duo project that had been interrupted by the pandemic i was on a tour with jim beard we're doing a a duo tour in Ireland at the time and we had oh, wow. to interrupt our trip and fly home which was really a drag um, but uh, because it was the music was was we were enjoying playing we were getting better at it and uh, we were having fun and it was you know we, we had several more gigs to go mm-hmm. so uh, I, I decided that I wanted to make sure we we kept that together as well as we could you know right when we when we could get together rehearse uh i wanted to try to do that and, and we have we've we've been able not not consistently there were some times when we just when nobody was getting together so we didn't but in general we've made an effort to sort of make sure that we keep our hand in on the material because it's a little difficult it's uh it, we, we did a record it's probably a couple of years ago that we put it out now it's called Chunks and Chair Knobs, the name of <laughs> one of Jim's songs. Jim is the the, the keyboard player in Steely Dan as well. So, you know, and uh, and he's an old buddy. I've known him for many many years. And uh, and we never did a duo record together until till this one. We've been playing with him for forty years in various contexts on lots and lots of records, lots and lots of bands. But we never did a duo thing. So we finally sure. got that together. And uh, and um, record came out well, and we were enjoying working it. So that was a priority. And we've I've kept that going. So uh, we're hoping that very soon we'll be able to start booking that again. The other thing I wanted to do was to find a way to sort of keep my hand in on a lot of the original music that's more of a pop rock kind of style that I've sure. done. That's I have four or five records of songs in that kind of style. And I wanted to make sure there was a way I could keep a little active that too. So 
that led to uh, the creation of another duo project, which uh, with, with the bass player uh, in my band, uh, a guy named Dennis Espantman. And he's the co-writer of most of the tunes that we've done in the last maybe five, six years, and, and some even before that. Uh, so we actually put together some tracks. I, I kind of recorded tracks, like backing tracks, music minus bass and guitar and vocals and we'll just right. so we we've and we've been rehearsing with that so it's a way we can actually uh probably do some gigs in smaller venues maybe house concerts and kind of keep keep a lid on the volume but right. still play with you know with like an electric guitar sound and uh an electric bass sound so so that that was another priority and that's been happening too which is great but the surprise i think the biggest surprise of the of the whole last year for me was I began to do uh, a couple of monthly workshops. Uh, one was with a great guitarist named uh, Alan Hines. Do you know Alan? In yes. California? I mean, I, that, he's in I know. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, he's become a buddy and uh, met him many years ago uh, when I was on the road out there uh, somehow. And, uh, and he's a really, really great guitar player, great music, super musical guy. And uh, so we've been doing these monthly workshops, and that kind of gave me the idea that I that I could host a workshop of my own. Actually, my assistant gave me this idea that she kind of encouraged me to try to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, uh, because I've had this kind of side interest ever since I was ever since I took my first uh, jazz guitar lessons with uh, the late great Harry Leahy, who was from Plainfield, New Jersey, a uh, fantastic guitar player and uh, teacher. He had studied with Johnny Smith. And mm. uh, and also with Dennis Sandoli, a Philadelphia famous Philadelphia teacher. So uh, Harry uh, introduced me to the style of like like chord melody playing, you know, on guitar, you know, just uh, I'm, I don't know what to play, but uh, you know, you know, the kind of where you where you actually play melodies uh, sure. of, of tunes, you know, and and harmonize them and get voice leading going and bass lines going and all that. Anyway. Um, Harry did this so well that I just and he, and he taught me enough about the guitar so I could begin to do this and so I started doing arrangements uh, for him in my lessons and I always had this idea that it, it would be cool to do a, to put a book out of of solo guitar arrangements mm -hmm. so about five six years ago I I actually got that together and I have two books that are that have been out for many years now I sell them on my website and you can probably find them on Amazon, Amazon places like that. But all of a sudden, with all this time alone, my interest was revived in the solo guitar thing, and, and I was convinced to try to do a workshop for interested people. Because over the years, people have bought the books, and some people wanted to, they had some questions about how to play some of the stuff in there, and they sure. wanted to see me play it. So so uh, I, I said, okay, well, I'll try it and see, see what happens. Well, it, it's been going for probably... Yeah, probably 11, 12 months now we've had like that many uh, of these workshops. And we get about 25 people to attend each time. Basically, what the, the, way, it's, the way I decided uh, to approach them was to pick three tunes that I would agree to arrange for the next mm -hmm. meeting and ask people who are going to be participants to try to arrange one of them. And then when we would meet in the zoom meeting we would literally compare notes you know, I'd, I'd play mine and they'd play theirs and we'd talk about process and you know how we and choices you can make and so mm -hmm. so just just and it kind of very quickly uh evolved into just a celebration of that kind of style of guitar playing which i thought for a while might be an endangered species you know but clearly it's not I've, i'm pretty convinced that it's not and and pretty soon after we started i, I started getting uh asking guests to to come on so that the participants would have a different point of view from my own, not just me, but other people too. Sure. So we've had some great guests and that's been fun. So, uh, the, but the real surprise was that because I was doing all these arrangements, uh, I've got two new books of arrangements, which are in the works and one's ready to print and the other one's close. Mm -hmm. And, uh, also I decided somewhere about yeah, maybe January, I think at the beginning of January, that because I was playing so many of these, that I ought to put a collection of my favorite arrangements that would that I think would, you know, sort of stand together on a on a record and just make a 
make a recording. So I, so I bothered to release a CD of 18 of the uh, solo arrangements that, uh, that I've done. Most of them were done in the, in the course of doing these workshops. So this was sort of a surprise uh, little uh, bonus of, well, that's, uh, that's, of being locked down, you know. <laughs> that's very cool. The record's called Quiet. Because, yeah. Because it is. It's and very different from all the other records I've done because, you know, the other ones are pop rock records and electric guitar and vocals. These this is all instrumental, all one sound on a jazz guitar and just just Oh, so you used standard a, a, jazz tune. You used an arch top? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I tried this guitar and uh, this one's uh I play this pretty much all the time. It it's it is sort of I can kind of go both ways with it you know right uh, it's not ideal for the j the jazz thing um i found and um uh, but I, I i avoid playing the jazz guitar because i've had some injuries with my it, left it, arm and hand yeah. and a lot of problems and it's it's harder to play the jazz guitar it's just it's, <laughs> it's a heavier setup it's heavier strings and slightly higher action and 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 that style just playing chord melody you're you're working all the time there this one go. right here almost never gets played it's absolutely a stunning instrument it i mean I, it is and I, it's made by ryan thorell it's a it's a full 17 inch traditional you know uh yeah. single pickup it's it's you know it's an amazing instrument but i don't play it very much for all the reasons you yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's a strat over there and uh and a thin line mm -hmm. like like yours i've got a right. I have a Collings I-35, which is a 15-inch body like yeah, that. That's great. And yeah. I love that guitar. And then there's a Strat over there with nines. One's got nines. The other one's got tens on it. Yeah, these have tens on them. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they're not really heavy strings on the jazz guitar. I have a Yamaha Archtuff guitar. And, yeah. And uh, it's... It's just a whole different thing, though, the way that... I mean, it's just it's... for that music. I mean, I, I wasn't sure. I, I, I could do no. that on this guitar, but... I record the same thing with both yeah. guitars, like the same song with both yeah. guitars. And listen, I, I said... And I actually I ran it by my buddy Dennis. You know, yeah. He's he's my sort of trusted my go to uh, sort of critic that way. And uh, and he said right away he says oh no, no hands down it's yeah it, there's there's the jazz the, guitar sounds those good gu those guitars um, and I, I've got one of those I've got one you know um, the attack and the and the crest factor oh, and yeah. rise time and the decay. Totally different. It's yeah. totally different, and that affects the way that you phrase, and it affects the way the notes come out. And yeah. that music just lends itself to that more staccato, if you will, type of uh, yeah. Type I of think attack. so, and and I think it's also just that our ears are so used to the sound of the tradition. You know, I mean, that's what happens. You know, like I mean, I, I, when, that's that's when valid. you hear Johnny Smith play that, yeah, you know, he's got a Johnny Smith guitar, <laughs> guitar of some sort. You know, I'm kind of, you want to cut uh, your fingers off. Yeah, it's yeah. a uh, it's a jazz guitar sound, and uh, and so because most of that is, uh, I mean. Not every not everything is an old uh, as a standard um, right. on that record or on the in these books. I have some more more uh, contemporary tunes in there too, some pop more pop tunes than jazz standards. But really, this for me the this the uh, when I fell in love with that sound and that approach that that style of arranging right. and playing guitar, it was really. Uh, it was a jazz guitar sort of sound, we, you know, and. We, uh, style you know we here at jazz guitar today uh we embrace both kinds of music country and western you know <laughs> <laughs> we, we 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 love the big fat arch top guitars and we love yes. the we love the strats and the tallies and and all of that with the overdrive and i've got pedal you know the whole nine yards but it's because it's just it's a different it's a different thing, but they're both good, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's there's just Mexican food, what there's Chinese food, there's Italian right. it's, food, there's it's just you know. a wider palette, and why yeah, not why not you know use all the colors you got? You know? Absolutely. Well, listen, this has been incredible. It really oh, has. Thanks, and Bob. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for for doing this. It's great. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I, is there anything else that you want to add to this before we say goodbye? Yeah, I, no, I'm good. I'm I'm just looking forward to getting out in the world and uh, working again. I'm. Uh, no, we're uh, looking want, forward to hearing you. Uh, it's it's been too long at home. I've I've gotten a chance recently to do like three little local gigs, and boy, boy, was it fun to just get in a, a big room and turn up an amp a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. This was the twenty-minute interview that's gone on for almost an hour. Oh yeah, <laughs> and we'll have to. We'll. we'll but I'm. But I, but that's that's we'll that's. Goodbye. 
you know, uh, listen, that's, you know, I've got, uh, it's, it's you, that's your, your gift to us and we appreciate it. So You're anyway, very welcome. I'm, I'm glad we could do this, Bob. Um, uh, this, nice. you know, Bob Baker, jazz guitar today, saying thanks to John Harrington. Thank great you so much, here. man. All right. It was really fun. Thank uh, you. Bob, and oh, yeah, by the way, thank you. you for being our first cover because you, you oh, took yeah. a flyer on us on that, you know, <laughs> I just said, Hey man, would you do it? And you, you said, yeah, sure. And, uh, here we are, you know, three years later, you know, so uh, still I'm glad on. I could do it. I'm Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye now. Bye. See Take you, care.